Uh, first, just for those of you who are not familiar, I'll just do a brief introduction to pharmacogenetics um, and then discuss maybe why we should focus on medically underserved patient populations when we're talking about implementing pharmacogenetics into clinical practice. And then uh, I'll present a little bit of uh, preliminary data, and then I'll spend the bulk of the, the talk uh, discussing our current project, uh, including, you know, how did we get our data? How did we sort of clean the data? What were some additional considerations that we uh, sort of were thinking about when we uh, were planning this uh, analysis and then the actual data analysis uh, plan? Uh, and then lastly, I'll end with, you know, with the results that we get, how do we sort of translate that into clinical practice? Because that's sort of the end end game here is, you know, we, we, we have this data, how do we sort of use the, use those data to change and, and hopefully further individualize patient care. So uh, just for those of you who aren't familiar, pharmacogenetics uh, at a very high level, it's just basically how genetic variation in a single or maybe a few genes affect your response to drugs. Now that could be uh, with regard to efficacy, so how well the drug works, or side effects, so how are, how how much sort of toxicity are you experiencing from the drug? And you may have also heard a similar term, pharmacogenomics. So technically, pharmacogenomics is a little bit a little bit broader scale. So how does genetics uh, and variation maybe affect genes across multiple genes across the genome? Uh, but realistically, they're used interchangeably. Um, what I have here is sort of a figure, kind of providing a very common example of a pharmacogenetic interaction. So if we think of um, uh, maybe genetic variation in a drug metabolizing enzyme uh, that is responsible for clearing a drug out of your body, um, that polymorphism or, or genetic variation could result in several different phenotypes. And so here you have the groups of phenotypes across the top. And so these representative of just general patients. So uh, we, we have if we're talking about a drug, a drug metabolizing enzyme, which is a very common pharmacogenetic interaction uh, example, uh, you, you can have uh, poor metabolizers. So these are patients who, oops, sorry, so have uh, two loss of function alleles. And so if you think about, uh, if you have two loss of function alleles, you're not making any sort of um, functional uh, enzyme. And so your drug levels are gonna be much higher than the average patient. And in many cases, above the therapeutic interval, so much higher than, than your, your physician really wanted them to be. And then there's the intermediate metabolizers where maybe you have one functional allele, but you have one non-functional allele. And so you're probably still going to have a, a higher uh, active drug level in the body, but it's, it's not going to be as high as in poor metabolizers. And then you have the normal metabolizers, which are really the, the, the group that are going to do the best on whatever given dose, they're usually the, the largest percentage of the, of the patient population. And they were basically who the drug and the drug dose were designed for. And so obviously if you have two functional alleles, the enzyme works as expected and you get a therapeutic drug level. Rapid metabolizers might be, you could potentially have an increased activity allele. And so, um, you're going to metabolize the drug faster than a normal metabolizer. And so you, you may still have therapeutic levels, but it's going to be a little lower. And then ultra rapid metabolizers, which would sort of be patients with two increased activity alleles, metabolize it so fast that perhaps you never get to that therapeutic interval. So for those patients, drug is not likely to work. And so that's that's kind of the, the spectrum. And you could imagine this could be almost the opposite situation if you were given a prodrug, which is basically a drug that requires uh, metabolism within your body in order to make active drugs. So you would, you would basically get a flip where ultra rapid metabolizers might have very high levels of drug and poor metabolizers would never sort of convert that prodrug to an active drug and they would really get no efficacy from the medication. Okay, so Pharmacogenetics is probably also a little more widespread than you think. So as of last count, there were well over 200 uh, different drugs where in the FDA um, regulated drug labeling, there is some mention of some sort of pharmacogenetic interaction. Now, how clinically useful those mentions are really vary quite a lot depending on the drug. 
but it is at least being sort of considered in a bunch of different drugs. Uh, and then when we sort of just focus on uh, on drugs that have very sort of high clinical utility pharmacogenetic uh, interactions, uh, there's been recent, there was a, a study actually a few years ago now that showed that um, within a health system, about 54% of patients received at least one medication uh, where pharmacogenetics could help sort of uh, guide dosing of that drug. And then in another study at a separate health system, uh, of, they looked at nearly 10,000 patients and they showed that 91% of the patients who had genotype data, uh, that they, they were also referred to a PGX clinic, had at least one actionable genotype. So this isn't a general population, but this is a population that is receiving these type of drugs. And it shows a vast majority of them actually have a pharmacogenetic variation that can be clinically actionable. And so given that, there is sort of this uh, organization, the Cl Ph Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, or CPIC for short, that actually provides uh, evidence-based guidelines to help prescribers use pharmacogenetic uh, data to better individualize their prescribing for patients. So if, if, you, have the, if you have the information, there are already uh, resources available to help you use that information in, in patient care. So how can we make, how can we, you know, sort of best make the use of, of this information um, for patients? And, and the way really that most people in the field have, have decided uh, the, the most efficient way is, is preemptive, is a preemptive testing model. And so basically that means you uh, do the testing before it's needed, and then you put that information in the electronic health record uh, for when it's when it may be needed. And so I, I think some of the reasons why preemptive testing is more efficient is probably pretty uh, obvious. So there, as I mentioned, there, there's just greater clinical utility when the results are available before the medication is prescribed. So that way, when a provider is trying to make a prescription decision, having that information uh, immediately like available at their fingertips uh, is, is better in a couple ways. First, they don't have to wait for a genetic test result to come back. So um, genetic tests generally take a lot longer than standard um, laboratory tests. So at our institution, for instance, it, we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of three to seven days. Uh, and so most prescribers don't want to wait three to seven days to write a prescription. The patient is usually sitting there in front of them right now. They know what the problem is. They know what the potential drug options are. And so they want to prescribe. And so that puts them in the position of either just skipping pharmacogenetic testing or ordering the test, writing a prescription right now, and then when the results come back, potentially having to make a change to the to their prescription. It also reduces the number of, of tests required in a patient's lifetime, and that's because unlike many other laboratory tests, genetic tests are pretty much good for your lifetime. And so it, it's sort of a more cost-effective way to test for a bunch of different genes, and then you sort of can use that information as it becomes needed. So, you know, if you don't get, if you get prescribed a drug for right now, that's great, but then maybe in 10 years you get prescribed another drug, and that pharmacogenetic data would still be useful to help the prescriber guide um, the dosing of that medication. The other thing is that, the other way it sort of decreased cost is that test batching can greatly decrease genotyping costs on a per patient basis. So. Um, the higher the, the testing volume in general, the lower the genotype cost can be, which is why, you know, for instance, 23andMe, I guess before they went bankrupt, uh, could, could afford to test people for 80 or hundred dollars because the volumes they were dealing at made the test testing cost on a per patient or a per customer basis, much lower than a standard laboratory test run in, in a healthcare system. And an another big sort of uh, hurdle with pharmacogenetic testing is that third-party payers, so basically like insurance companies and, and government uh, payers, are not really excited about paying for another test, uh, uh, particularly insurance companies because they work on a sort of yearly cycle, right? So they're interested in paying for things that will help their patient this year because they don't know if you're going to be their patient next year. Um, and so sort of 
panels that might be good for your lifetime don't really interest them because they're not likely to see the benefits of, of those additional results. And so really what we've decided is then, okay, well, if we can't do this for everyone, why don't we try to identify patients who are most likely to benefit? And then we'll focus implementation on those patient populations, at least to start, um, and then expand from there. So how do you find a patient most likely to benefit? So I think, you know, probably an obvious patient would be maybe someone who is just newly prescribed a medication that could be informed by pharmacogenetic guidelines. And so maybe for short, for the rest of this talk, we'll call them PGX drugs. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a medication that has pharmacogenetic guidelines. And so it's a it's sort of very easy to use that information to, to improve prescribing for that particular drug. But probably a, an even more clinically useful group would be patients who are being or will soon be considered for a pharmacogenetic drug. As we discussed, sort of while that prescribing decision-making is being uh, made, that's actually the best time to sort of uh, have those results available. Another reason I'll add that I that I sort of forgot to add in the, in the previous slide is that um, that also allows us to build computer decision support around these results. So if the results are already in the system, if a prescriber goes to order a drug that maybe uh, the, the patient's pharmacogenetic results suggest is not a good choice, we can, we can flash an alert within the EHR system right as they're ordering it that says, hey, this patient is, you know, has a pharmacogenetic drug interaction. Um, so this is probably not a great choice. Would you rather consider these other options where there is no sort of similar pharmacogenetic drug interaction? And providers really like that because that allows them to sort of have all the information right then and there, um, and then they can make a decision in real time. Um, but the problem with that is, so how do we predict who's likely to be considered for a specific medication? So maybe we could do it by disease diagnosis. You know, patients who are, you know, diagnosed with X disease are likely to be prescribed this class of drug. And so let's go ahead and test them while they're right at diagnosis. So then when a drug uh, decision is being made, the results are already there. That, that's one option. Sometimes though, the, the time interval between diagnosis and prescription is almost it's basically the same visit, in which case then we couldn't get results back in time. But I think for a lot of cases, that could work. Uh, but are there also general demographic characteristics that might make a patient more likely to get a prescription for a, a PGX drug? And so for an example we thought of, is like, you know, older patients are more likely to be prescribed medications in general. And so um, could that be a similar case, you know, for PGX drugs? So... Also want to think about another sort of population to consider. What about low income or medically underserved patients? Um, I, I'll tell you, PGX drugs tend to be older and therefore off patent, so they cost less. And so there could be the possibility that these patients are actually prescribed um, PGX drugs at a higher rate. Another reason is sort of this inverse equity hypothesis that was proposed, I don't know, probably, probably 20 years ago now, uh, where Medically underserved patients obviously experience barriers to healthcare access. And when you're implementing sort of these new innovative health technologies, and we'll, we'll sort of put preemptive pharmacogenetic testing in that sort of category, um, they're generally the last people to benefit from it. And what that can cause is that that can actually increase healthcare disparities further because who generally gets the most who gets the, the sort of the innovative healthcare technologies first, right? Those are the patients who are not underserved. Patients who have great access to healthcare, uh, great insurance, plenty of money. Those are the patients who get it first. But in some cases, the medically underserved patients are the patients who actually need it more, but they're the last ones to get it. And so that can sort of broaden uh, disparities. And it's, you know, it's completely unintentional, right? You're trying to make healthcare better, but in some ways, for some populations, you end up broadening disparities. And so the, the, the hypothesis is this is going to continue to occur unless you sort of target these populations uh, with these new technologies as they're being clinically implemented. And so we wanted to sort of do a, a, a preliminary analysis, at least um, in our healthcare system. So we, we, we um, basically asked the question, are medically underserved patients within the UF health system prescribe PGX drugs at a higher rate than other patients? 
Um, and so we pull data from our entire health system. And so just to give you an idea, UF Health uh, is the six health science colleges, two academic hospitals, and then we have a bunch of uh, community hospitals and clinics across uh, North Central, Northeast Florida, and then a little bit in Southeast Georgia. And you can see our rough catchment area here on the right and you can see it's actually a pretty diverse area. So we have some large metro areas, uh, but then we also have some rural areas as well that we cover. So I think we have a pretty uh, diverse patient population. Uh, it's also fairly large, uh, manages over 3 million inpatient and outpatient visits a year. And we have patients from all 67 counties of Florida. So while this is our primary catchment area, we do, tr we do serve patients across the state of Florida. And so what we basically requested was uh, uh, EHR data from uh, adults who had uh, prescription records available uh, within our health system and were uh, resided within the state of Florida. And so we ended up with uh, almost 68,000 patients and we calculated, we ca basically did an estimated uh, geographic access uh, that we calculated. Uh, from patient home zip code. And I'll talk about a little bit more about the methods, how we did that uh, a little later on. Um, but basically what we what we found, and this is this fi the figure on the right. So this is uh, uh, sort of this access score, the geographic access score to healthcare that we uh, calculated. We basically broke it into quartiles with quartile one being sort of the best care. And so we use those as the reference group. And then quartile two, three, and four, all with sort of worsening levels of, uh, or access, worsening access to, to healthcare providers. And what we found here, so this figure is actually uh, healthcare en encounter. So an, en an encounter with a healthcare provider. And what we found was that patients with lower geographic access scores uh, had fewer healthcare, uh, fewer encounters with a healthcare provider, which is, is means that our, our estimates worked, right? And what we found was if you sort of broke that down, that quartile down by race, that uh, Black and Hispanic patients had even fewer uh, uh, encounters with healthcare providers than uh, patients of other races within that, that geographic access. And you can see that sort of highlighted here, the quartile with quartile four. Uh, so then when we looked at uh, PGX pres prescription rates, uh, PGX drug prescription rates, we indeed found that uh, all basically patients of any race in that sort of lowest quartile um, were, were prescribed a significantly higher proportion of PGX drugs. Now it's not a huge uh, sort of effect size, uh, but it's it, it was it, it, it's probably a clinically meaningful amount. Uh, but then when, again, when we broke it down by race, we found that uh, black patients had an even higher rate of PGX drug prescribing than sort of the, the overall quartile. And so, and you can see that here actually in, in both quartiles, uh, three and four, but particularly in, in quartile four. And so basically what we concluded from this uh, initial paper was that, you know, poor geographic access may exacerbate already sort of present racial health, health disparities. Uh, and that, uh, Indeed, as our as, as we sort of hypothesize that patients with with reduced access to healthcare are more likely to be prescribed a PGX drug, and when you put those two together, I think it really highlights how medically underserved patients are a particularly uh, probably strong candidate to receive preemptive pharmacogenetic testing because they're not seeing their their healthcare providers as much, and they're getting prescribed more drugs with pharmacogenetic guidelines. So. If they're not seeing their healthcare provider as much, they're not going to be able to have the same opportunity to sort of do the traditional trial and error approach to prescribing. So, you know, like think about when, you, when you've ever gone to see your primary care physician, they'll prescribe you a drug and then you go home and take it. And if it works, great. If not, you call them back up, you have another appointment and you say, hey, this drug didn't work and they'll prescribe you something different and you try that. Or you say, hey, this gave me side effects. Okay, well, let's switch you to something else. And, and you just kind of trial and error. And so if we can use pharmacogenetics to hopefully get the drug right the first time, these patients are going to benefit the most because they're not coming back as often to sort of, you know, trial and error, whatever their drug they were prescribed. And so that brings us to our current project. Um, and so this was an NIH funded uh, project. And our overall objective was to sort of 
not only to identify PGX uh, drug usage patterns in, in patients, but also to assess feasibility and effectiveness of actually doing preemptive pharmacogenetic testing in underserved patient populations. And we, sort, we had three aims. I'll go over the three aims, but really, as, as you'll see, we really are the focus of this talk is AIM-1. And so, you know, AIM-1 was to identify factors associated with PGX drug prescribing patterns. Uh, AIM-2 is to develop a, a, a low-cost ancestrally inclusive PGX testing panel. Um, and then AIM-3 was to actually test the feasibility and the effect on patient satisfaction of actually implementing preemptive pharmacogenetic testing into the clinics. And so really what we're going to talk about is uh, our work in AIM-1. And so really the goal was to identify factors that can identify patients to recommend for preemptive PGX testing. As I mentioned at the top of the, the talk, our, our goal is to really derive data that can inform our clinical implementation efforts. And so what we used as a sort of our data source was uh, the One Florida Data Trust, which is part of the uh, One Florida Clinical Research Consortium. Uh, and it's a PCORI funded uh, group uh, and, and, and they basically collect uh, uh, data from participating healthcare systems across the state. I have a figure here on the right. You can see all the different healthcare systems that are participating and you can see how they're sort of spread across the entire state of Florida. And they all contribute data using the PCORnet common data model into this sort of centralized data trust. And so they claim to have longitudinal, longitudinal EHR data on 20 million patients. Uh, and if you look at the population of Florida, that means they have data on approximately 90% of the state of Florida. And so what we did was we requested data uh, from adult patients with at least one uh, prescription medication documented within a four-year date range. And we also asked that their home residents be within Florida. We wanted to, because one Florida stretches a little bit out into Georgia and neighboring states, so a little bit into Georgia, a little bit into Alabama. So we just, since those weren't, those states weren't fully covered, we wanted to focus on just the state of Florida. And so we were really looking for predictors uh, that are easily extractable from the EHR because we think that's really the best way for this to sort of be implemented in a clinical practice are, is if you're using variables that are likely to be present in almost every patient. And so the methods where we were sort of decided to use for predictor identification is both sort of your conventional regression models, but also machine learning and AI models. And our goal is to sort of compare them to see if, if one is better than the other or if they're pretty much equivalent in their predictive abilities. Um, and so, I think that's our, oh, there we go. Yeah, so, so we kind of hop. Back. Yeah, there we go. So, uh, so the type of data that we that we collected from the uh, One Florida Data Trust or were able to, to acquire were, were demographic data, uh, prescription data, uh, and the prescription data were quite extensive. Diagnoses, and so diagnoses are mostly just ICD-10 codes, um, which you know, as I'm sure many of you are aware, have sort of their their pros and cons. Uh, procedures, so we had inf information on procedure codes, primarily CPT, but there were some other other types of codes as well. Uh, and then encounter data, so mostly just date and type. So, and by type, I mean just general category. So they they would not give you uh, specifics. So like this patient saw their dermatologist or whatever, but we could get down to the level of they had an inpatient encounter, an outpatient encounter, a hospitalization, ER visit, what have you. Um, and then we were also able to, to collect vital signs. Uh, the, the, those were probably the, the worst populated of, of, the, of the different data types. And then five digit home zip code, which as, as we sort of discussed earlier, was really crucial in order to be able to predict um, some of these measures of, of medical underservice. And so speaking of that, how do, how, do, how do we identify medically underserved patients? I'm sure as you know, there's no field in the EHR that says this patient's underserved or they're not, right? Uh, and that's partly that's for a couple of reasons. Partly because that's not what EHRs are designed for, but also because there's no agreed upon definition on what a medically underserved patient is. So it's it's not really easy to define, and it's it's definitely not something that is going to be easily extracted from the EHR. So what we 
decided to do alternatively were think about characteristics we could easily get from the EHR that might reduce a patient's access to receiving optimal health care. So, you know, obviously we thought of demographic uh, factors that might sort of sort of affect or sort of at least be in play, socioeconomic factors, again, with our plan, because it's not in the EHR, for our plan to, to calculate those based on sort of where the patient lives, uh, and geographic as well, and primarily the mechanism we're going to do is the healthcare geographic access score that we mentioned uh, previously. And again, these are all, met, all, all estimate, estimates that are using a home address. So the first one we're using, you probably, I'm sure you've probably heard of this one. It's very, very been around for a while, very commonly used, the Social Deprivation Index, or SDI. This was developed by the Robert Graham Center to quantify levels of disadvantage. And so they use data from the American Community Survey, which is a, a sort of a part of the uh, US Census, um, to sort of collect these specific characteristics and then sort of build that into a score based on different areas. So they assign a score to each area, and then you can sort of uh, use those, those scores. And so they use the, uh, these are the, I think the primary factors that they used, and a lot of them kind of make sense. So, you know, a, a percent of population less than 100% of the federal poverty line, uh, they used employment uh, data, education, uh, housing, and then a, a few demographics regarding age and race and stuff like that. Another newer method we've decided to, to include as well is a social vulnerability metric. And so this was uh, just recently developed um, and it and it also kind of gets at a, something a little bit different. It's, it actually is, is designed to quantify levels of social determinants of health. So a little bit of a broader, I would say, look. Um, and they get their data source from the AHRQ Social Determinants of Health database, which includes a lot of other publicly available data sources, including the American Community Survey that uh, that is sort of used for SDI. And they actually have 24 total measures. I'm not sure if you can read this. Hopefully you can, um, but you don't have to read it. It's a lot of them are the same, but then there are some additional um, measures that that aren't considered in, in, a, in some of the older methods. So for instance, you know, percentage of how households without a computer or a smartphone is their only type of computing device. Uh, insurance coverage is another one that they sort of look at that, that's a little bit different. And that's particularly interesting to us. Healthcare insurance is it, it can be a, a really important driver on the level of healthcare that a patient receives. And then so, uh, the, the the third of, sort of third metric we're using is the healthcare geographic access score, and we've basically adapted this from uh, from uh, others who have who have who have used similar access scores for to answer sort of different questions. Um, but basically, we 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 start with a zip code, and so it's it's a relatively small unit of area uh, created by the postal service. So you know, ha ha really designed mostly for mail delivery. Um, and the other nice thing about a five-digit zip code is, in most cases, it's not considered PHI, um, unless you live in a, in a in a zip code that is very sparsely populated. And then, and, and there are some cases where it is, but for for our our purposes, it was uh, much much easier to sort of uh, acquire. And then basically, what you do is you convert that to zip code tabulation areas or ZCTAs, uh, because zip codes themselves are not very stable that the the post office changes them around whenever they want to and so you you need something a little more stable uh, and so the census bureau came up with these ETTAs which are really based off of zip codes but are more stable and don't sort of change whenever the post office needs to adjust their routes um, and so basically what we did was we calculated within each of these ETTAs geographic population centers and we needed to do that because if we're going to if we're going to find you know how well someone can access healthcare providers. We need to know sort of where most of those people in, in the in the ZCTA live and what the drive time would be to any available healthcare providers. And so we identified healthcare providers from the national plan and provider enumeration system. Uh, and then that, that gives you locations, uh, but it's not updated a lot. And so what we did was we, uh, we used uh, active NPI numbers for providers to filter the ones that the, the, the providers that are actually still actively practicing. And then we calculated drive times to healthcare providers from those 
uh, population center, the ZCTA population centers using a two-step floating catchment area method. And so really the, the thing to take ho home from that is that the cool thing about this method is that it doesn't sort of consider um, arbitrary borders. So like county lines, city limits, zip codes, it doesn't matter. It's just what's the driving time from point A to point B? Because so, these are not things that you would consider if, you know, if your doctor that you really like is in the next county over, you're not going to not go to them because they're in a different county, right? You'll just drive there. And so that's that's kind of what we were hoping to capture. And then what we did was we said, okay, how many healthcare providers are within a 30 minute drive time to whatever this location is? And then we were able to sort of calculate uh, a, a geographic access score based on that. And so what we have here is a map of Florida with all the ZCTAs, and we've colored them based on quartiles of access. And you can see, uh, if you're not familiar with the state of Florida, the, the, the sort of areas of greater access are exactly what we would think. So in the sort of north uh, northeast here, that's Jacksonville, Florida. This is Gainesville, Florida. So this is where University of Florida is. This is Orlando right in the middle. And then on the coast here is Tampa. And then there's the Miami sort of Palm Beach County area. And so, of course, those are the areas where all the healthcare providers are, right? Those are the sort of the, the more uh, developed areas of the state. And then you have these other areas out here it, that have some of the, the uh, poorest access because they're generally more rural and there are just sort of less healthcare providers in those areas. So the next step was data cleaning. So first, how do we even define a PGX drug? And so that one wasn't too bad. We basically said, well, we'll consider any medication that has CPIC guidelines as of this past September. That is what we'll call a PGX drug. And then we mapped per prescriptions to uh, ingredient level RxQEs. And so this is, for those of you aren't familiar, RxQEs are a way to identify drugs, but they have, they're sort of levels similar to ICD. And so we actually went down to the ingredient level. And the reason for that is because these are unique identifiers for drugs. And so that could be by brand name, it could be for a combination product. And we wanted to sort of just figure out what are the actual drugs that they're taking. And we wanted to be able to, to, to sort of group those together. And then when we were sort of cleaning the prescription data, uh, we came across sort of a bunch of issues. And so for instance, which medications to include? Do we include over-the-counter medications? Well, those are generally not well um, documented in, in the EHR and they're mostly taken at the whim of the patient, right? So if uh, my knee hurts, I'm gonna take Tylenol for a week. Well, now I'm not taking it anymore. That may not get documented in the EHR that they started or stopped, or maybe just one or the other. Another uh, issue is, do we include PRN medications? So medications that are supposed to be taken as needed. Well, some medications, particularly like opiates or something, do have pharmacogenetic guidelines and are associated with significant morbidity, and in some cases, mortality. Uh, so, do we include those or do we say, well, generally those patients are not necessarily on those medications for long periods of time. And so that was something we grappled with. Another one is historical medications. So these are medications that the patient says I'm taking, but are not documented in the EHR. And those uh, similar problems along the lines of OTC medications, because they're again, not well documented and sometimes they'll just stay forever. And then you talk to the patient and say, no, I haven't taken that drug in three years. And then there are also certain routes of administration. So there really aren't a lot of examples where pharmacogenetics could guide, like for instance, a medicated shampoo. And so, but we get we get everything. And so we had to kind of filter through and think about, well, which of these you know prescriptions do we really think are um, medications that that either would be considered a pharmacogenetic drug or not, or some of these are are, are probably not super impactful or systemically absorbed. And so we had to go through that. And then when we talk about medications we want to include, many of these, particularly as we talked about at the very beginning, uh, when we're talking about uh, pharmacogenetic interactions with drug metabolizing enzymes, a lot of these are dose dependent. Um, so the higher the, the dose you're taking, the, the, the greater the impact of the pharmacogenetic uh, interaction. The problem is, yeah, we do get dose and we do get frequencies, but that's kind of tough to calculate, particularly if one of those fields is not populated? Or what if it's a range? What if it's take this every four to six hours? That's really impossible to calculate. Uh, and unless you kind of go through it manually, which on the scale we're dealing with, 
that's just not possible. And then route administration is also important because some drugs, for instance, are taken orally, and then we think, yes, they're systemic absorption, but then other, the same drug could be taken, you know, for instance, as a cream and may not be absorbed at all. Uh, and then there's a similar issue with combination products, which is why we had to go down to the ingredient level because um, we wanted to be able to capture those uh, combination products separately. So uh, more data uh, cleaning considerations. So how do you identify likely errors in the data versus legitimate data, but it's just an outlier because we're dealing with, uh, with such large numbers of patients. So for example, we had a patient that had over 1,300 encounters with a healthcare provider within a four-year period. And we thought, how is that possible? That means they would literally have to be going almost every day. And so we went, we got back with the One Florida data, uh, One Florida folks, and they said, well, we have had very rare occurrences of uh, patient data getting combined because again, they're trying to harmonize data from a bunch of different healthcare systems and identify patients who may have been to multiple healthcare systems and put it together as one patient entry. And so basically what we decided to do is filter out some of these that just are unlikely to be physically possible. Uh, and then another issue we kind of had to think about was grouping high dimensional data. And so, as I mentioned, we collected ICD-10 codes, uh, but there are 68,000 ICD codes and we probably got at least 50,000 of those it seemed like, we have a lot. And so if we tried to put all of those into a regression model or even a machine learning model, it's it's so many that it's uh, we're we're risking uh, missing missing potential uh, useful predictive variables or overfitting. And an example of this is you know for instance ICD ten, 10 code uh, I twenty two point zero is a ST elevated myocardial infarction, so it's a heart attack on the anterior wall of the heart, whereas twenty two point one is a uh, a heart attack on the inferior wall. And so do we really think drug response or need for pharmacogenetic drugs will be influenced at that level? Probably not. And so the next step is, well, how do we sort of group those ICD-10 codes? Because the current hierarchy they're in is not really necessarily uh, clinically useful sometimes. And so we tried to have, had to try to find ways to group those in a way that might may, may be more uh, clinically applicable. And then we had to harmonize different methods for data. So as I mentioned, for instance, for uh, procedures, primarily we've got CPT codes, but we also got a bunch of ICD-10 PCS codes, which are also procedure codes. And we had to find a way to sort of uh, cr cross crosswalk those. Um, and then I ju just a few other additional considerations. So as you can tell, we thought about this a lot. Uh, so what constitutes a patient, right? So we got all the EHR data for everyone who ever met the criteria we we asked for. Um, but do we really think we're going to have enough data to do any sort of prediction on a patient who shows up within this four-year window one time, gets one prescription, and then we never hear from them again for the next four years? Uh, probably not. And so we decided, well, we, we're going to need some minimum number of encounters uh, within that, within the participating health systems within one Florida, within that time period, in order for us to be satisfied, at least we could consider them a quote unquote patient and we probably have enough data on them. And then this other issue we sort of talked about, what about patients who were considered for a drug but ended up getting prescribed a different drug? PGX data could still be helpful for them. The problem is there's a lot that goes into prescribing a drug beyond just, you know, well, I have all these options in this class and they're all equally effective, so I'm just gonna pick one at random or this is just the one I as a prescriber like better. And so it, just from the EHR data that we were able to collect, that would be really hard. And so we decided maybe we can't do that with the data that we have. So deriving the final data set, we started with almost 1.4 million patients uh, who met sort of the initial criteria that we asked for uh, from One Florida. But then when we sort of ended up going through the data uh, and so all the data cleaning, we lost uh, over 350,000 patients. And you can see sort of some of the, the very common reasons. So uh, we didn't have, you know, there's some issue with the zip code data, the large encounter number we talked about. We ended up go just cutting off the top 0.01%. Um, if they were missing procedure diagnosis codes, um, or if they didn't have, so again, we, we settled on two encounters over the study period. And so there were several of these patients, as we sort of provided the example, who just show up once, get a drug, and you never hear from them again. And so what we ended up with is a little over a million patients who sort of met the criteria for analysis. And you can see here our final data set. Uh, 
again, I don't want to go through every every specific uh, characteristic, but I just want to show we have a million patients, pretty diverse, uh, both uh, from a racial and ethnicity perspective, but also um, as far as the 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 medical under medical service or under service level. So for instance, SDI is on a scale of one to 100 with 50 being kind of in the middle. And so we're right around there. SVM is, I think it's like negative two point something to positive two point something. And so we're right around zero. So again, good. And geographic access score, um, as we've shown, we we have pretty pretty accurate uh, estimates within UF Health data of, of, and we've corresponded that with uh, encounters with healthcare providers. And so our analysis plan, well, the first the first big question is what PGX medications are, are most used in underserved patients. Uh, and so basically what we're going to do is compare prescription rates between underserved patients and other patients. And uh, our plan is to use a binomial regression. We're going to adjust for these covariates because there are some things that we think could confound, for instance, age. You know, if you're older, you're more likely to get prescribed medications. And another example is the Charleston comorbidity index, which really gets at uh, sort of how sick are you? So if you're more if you're a more sick patient, again, you're obviously more likely to be prescribed medications. Um, and then we also want to sort of look at the incident rate ratios for uh, underserved patients, and then compare that to the overall patient population in general. And then our other question is, what patient specific factors best predict PGX medication use? That's really what we're hoping to get to be able to move forward with um, uh, our our PGX implementation efforts. And so we're going to basically derive prediction estimates for all the clinical, demographic, and socioeconomic factors that we've sort of discussed in the, in the talk. And we're going to start with standard regression models, and then we'll also do a lasso regression. Um, but re the really, I think, exciting stuff that unfortunately we haven't got to yet uh, are the machine learning models. And so the, the four we've sort of decided on are random forest, XG boost, uh, a stacking ensemble model, and then a neural network. We, we're we're going to try that one. We've never done that one, um, but I think we can, th that's sort of acknowledged as like a true AI method, and we think that would be something interesting to try, and then sort of see how well does it perform. And then so, again, model the model evaluation. So our plan is we're going to do a holdout, so we'll randomly divide the patient population into two groups. We'll have the training data set, which is going to be 80% of the population, and then we'll have a test data set, which is 20%. And then we're going to evaluate basically uh, using recall, uh, you know, then accurate accuracy and precision, which is very commonly done. And 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 then again, area under the receiver operated curve. So ROC curves are a really great way to sort of uh, look at uh, predict predictive ability. And you know, hopefully we'll be closer to this purple. Realistically, if we're anywhere between this red and blue, we'll be happy. Uh, and then another thing we're going to look at because we're using multiple models is an intermodal agreement. So if all of the models are kind of saying a similar thing, I think that makes us feel much better about the results than if they're, each model is giving us sort of a different answer. So what are sort of the expected outcomes? Well, we hope that we're going to sort of confirm our previous findings that, we, that we've published, uh, showing that underserved patients are really prescribed a higher rate of PGX medications, but also hopefully identify subgroups with this larger sample size. We can identify subgroups that are really sort of driving the effect that we that we found. So for instance, could it just be maybe patients with reduced geographic access? Maybe it doesn't really have much to do with social deprivation or or social, other social determinants of health. We don't know. And that's with this sort of much larger data set, we're hoping to be able to answer that question. And then the other question is, or the other sort of outcome we're hoping to, to achieve is identify patient populations with a higher rate of PGX uh, prescription, whether that be a, a clinical group, so maybe patients who are are, are sort of uh, uh, in a potential clinical group, uh, such as you know diagnosis or uh, spend a lot of have a lot of healthcare uh, encounters, wh whatever, um, because then we're hoping to then target our implementation to those patients to start. The other hope is that this could be you know evidence that we publish and that we can point to when we're talking to third party payers about reimbursing for the test, like look, these patients are more likely to get these drugs in the near future. So if you pay for this, this is going to benefit your patient in the near term, not just, you know, 10 years from now. And so the final thing I'd like to talk about is sort of how do we translate this to clinical practice? And this is the, the one thing that we've spent a lot of time thinking about, but we don't really have a good answer yet. 
Um, I would I, I would like to start by saying I think PGX testing is a lot lower risk. So it's probably a lower bar to implementing than it might be if you're deciding whether or not to use a drug or something like that. Because this is this in and of itself does not directly affect the patient. This just provides more information for the prescriber to use when making treatment decisions. However, the whole reason we're doing this is because there is a cost associated with testing. So we can't just do it for everyone. And so um, we ideally wanna find groups of patients that are gonna get the most benefit uh, while still uh, achieving some level of cost efficiency. And then what's sort of the threshold based on the results that we find, what's the threshold for, for actually saying, yes, this is strong enough this is strong enough for us to move forward into clinical practice. Uh, yes, well, let's start at UF Health, starting to identify these groups of patients and offering preemptive pharmacogenetic testing too. Is there a specific ROC value that will say, okay, well, that's good enough? Or is it maybe like I discussed earlier, if all of our, our models and methods are all kind of saying the same thing, do we feel uh, sufficiently comfortable saying, okay, that's ready to move forward? Or do we need to take these results and then sort of confirm them or validate them in a completely independent patient population. That would probably be the hardest method and the most conservative, but maybe that's what it's gonna take for us to feel comfortable before implementing this clinically. So before I, I finish, obviously I did not do all this work myself. I'd like to acknowledge people uh, in our, in our, on our team who've sort of been working on this. Uh, my collaborator, Katrin McDonough, has is, is been sort of the, the primary data scientist on this. Hua Nguyen is our health informaticist. Uh, Brian Goronsky is uh, the, my graduate student who's been uh, doing a lot of the um, uh, analysis planning and helping with the data cleaning. And then Rachel Dalton is a, a former postdoc of mine who, who did a lot of the preliminary uh, medically underserved uh, uh, analyses that we saw earlier. And so with that, I'll close. And hopefully there's time for a few questions if anyone has any. Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Duarte. This has been absolutely fascinating, uh, giving us, you know, an overview that we have about PTX, you know, all these drugs and uh, what are the possible implications for patient care? Uh, you know, the factors that you're doing, whether they have access to health care, um, you know, this, what are the factors? Maybe because you're older, there's more prescription disease. What can be the side effect? You know the relationship, the balance between cost effectiveness, and I said um, in the healthcare of those particular patients, it became very obvious in your um, your presentation. Definitely, there's no answers at this point, but it's something to be looking to it. I'm looking so. Thank you for that very comprehensive speech. Um, and I do want to say that before we started, you say you wish you would have more data results, but I think it was. Um, one of the things that we were able to get is the challenges doing data cleaning. And you and I were talking before, you know, how is in different project, research project we have, that takes much longer. And I think you yeah. made a real good point about, about that uh, today. And so we have a number of questions um, in the chat, and I think we are going to have to go to go to the front. Let me see one that we just got. So while we're looking at the other one, um, so I think, do you want me just to start going through the... Yeah, that would be great. I was just okay. looking at so it. The first one, it looks like, is this information learned through one blood test? Exactly. I'll uh, the yeah. answer is yes. So, um, or you don't even need a blood test. So we can, we can do pharmacogenetic testing or really any genetic testing um, through blood, but we can also do uh, mouthwash or buckle swab. So you just take a swab and you swab the inside of your cheek. You put it in an envelope, send it to the lab, and they can do the, the genetic testing like that. Um, we have Nicole Pierce, and uh, there are several questions from that. And then also I want to go after we address those, uh, Dr. Duarte. Then we have Shala that had raised a hand, so I don't want to ignore that. So let's go to Nicole Pierce. And can you see it? It's next. Uh, the next question? Yeah. Yeah. Are there let's problems? Go. Are there problems with insurance not covering a second prescription if the genetic test result so a change is needed? Um, yeah, so we're not necessarily, we're primarily concerned with, uh, with the insurance companies paying for the test. So they don't wanna reimburse for the test because um, 
well, for a lot of reasons, but they, they, they don't really want to pay for another test. Um, and so it's more with that. Uh, the second prescription, you, you do bring up a good point that if you did prescribe a, a medication and then like three or three to seven days later, completely changed it, then the, then they might, the insurance company say, why are we paying for a very similar drug in the same therapeutic class? We just paid for that. So there are issues with that, but we're really primarily talking about reimbursement for the test. Uh, other question from Nicole, have you found these people with limited access have insurance plans that do not approve genetic testing? Um, in some cases, yes. Uh, in, in many cases, they don't have insurance coverage. And so then we're looking at a, a, a cash out-of-pocket payment, which is for most most uh, 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 sort of low-income medically underserved patients, not feasible. Uh, so we are working with Medicaid uh, within the state of Florida and Medicare. Medicare has kind of been slowly moving towards uh, 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 at least paying for some pharmacogenetic testings and some examples. You have the next question with, for uh, Kelly Butner, and I noticed that Dr. Spence, which I want to acknowledge him, he's one of our adjunct faculty, but also he um, works at UTMD Anderson, Kansas City in, in the pharmacy department. He's the manager of the quality control uh, unit. So I don't know if you want to expand anything further that what Dr. Spence has said in there. Yeah, no, I mean, so yeah, we, we, we were looking for inpatient and outpatient. And so, and really the, the PCORNET common data model primarily works with uh, ICD-9 or 10 code, depending on the time period for, for diagnosis. Uh, Leo Como, and I haven't forgotten uh, that Chala, and we'll come back to that, but she has, uh, Leo has a, a good question that I think it might appeal to the audience. Uh, do you think that PX drugs data is going to become a standard part of testing and development of new drugs? Yeah, good question. Um, in fact, in some cases, they already has. Uh, so, so there are certain circumstances where FDA uh, will re not require, but strongly request from drug companies that they do pharmacogenetic testing. Uh, or, or they they look to see if pharmacogenetics affects response to a, a drug that they're trying to get approved. Um, and probably not worth it to go into the details, but yeah, there are certain circumstances and the EMA, so the European version of the uh, FDA actually has certain circumstances where they require it. If, if the drug's metabolized by a certain drug metabolizing enzyme that we know is polymorphic and that's like responsible for for like a very large percentage, then you have to do pharmacogenetic studies. And I think Japan, their FD, their equivalent, does something similar. So the answer is yes, and um, we're definitely moving in that direction. But we have Dr. Patel um, uh, here who has raised the question, and I think it's it's a good one, uh, Dr. Duarte. You might want to see, especially the second part uh, of the question. How can preemptive pharmacogenetic testing be effectively implemented under surveillance limited health? Geographic access and, and, what, and the strategies. I think that might be something that it might be interesting to talk. Yeah, and so that's a great question. Uh, and so yes. we we thought a lot about that. Um, we actually have developed um, methods for sort of having you know sort of these satellite clinics who primarily serve patients with poor access to healthcare, um, where they can. That's the nice thing about about a, a cheek swab is you can just swab it, put it in an envelope and mail it. And if it takes, you know, if you overnight it or it's by courier, so it takes, you know, 12 hours to get to the, the lab, it's totally fine. And so what we're, we're trying to do is create within our health system, sort of a infrastructure where it doesn't matter where you're at, where you're accessing the health system from. If it is sort of a rural clinic or if it's like our downtown main hospital, you still have access to this care. And that's through sort of, creating the infrastructure to allow the shipment of samples. And since we are all use a common electronic health record, return of results is very easy. Um, so it's really just getting that sample to the lab in a timely fashion to allow them to turn around the test results in a, in a useful timeframe. Well, I think <clears throat> this is a wonderful way just to end this absolutely fabulous presentation. You have brought us so much awareness about the PGX drugs and the testing, and where is it that the benefit that can be in patient care, especially in different populations. I think you have highlighted some of the disparities that they exist to it. And once there's an awareness that this can be a strategy, a plan to how to address it. 
So look at the time on behalf of the Health Informatics Program and the Department of Information Science, the College of Information on behalf of the Dean. I would like to say thank you very much for sharing with, with us your research and we wish you the very best.